Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Dayan Chita. Good evening. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, uh, terms you may have heard, dukkha and karana, usually translated into English as suffering and compassion. And uh, mostly I'm trying to work out what these mean for me within Zen, since I, I struggle with them, especially karana. I don't feel a lot of dukkha these days, but I'm, I'm also not sure how much uh, karana I feel either. So maybe I'm trying to rationalize my own practice or at least understand it better. So let's begin with dukkha or suffering. So we know that that suffering, you know, people, uh, popular belief of Buddhism is, you know, Buddhism says life is suffering, but we know that suffering is not is, is an incomplete, if not completely inaccurate translation of dukkha, right? It means suffering, but also uh, dissatisfaction, discontent, uh, even a general feeling that things aren't quite right. It covers a, a range of experiences from a, a major trauma uh, to existential dread, to feeling inconvenienced when the line at the grocery store doesn't move quite fast enough. All of these are forms of dukkha. So for non-Buddhists, suffering implies a cause outside our minds. That slow grocery line is causing me to suffer. This insult is causing me to suffer. And this excruciating pain in my intestines is causing me to suffer. But in Zen, the, the suffering, like everything else, is a creation of our minds. Right? Nobody can make me angry. My getting angry at an insult is an evidence of some sort of mind control on the part of the insulter. They're making me angry. Right? If I have physical pain, the complaining and resentment and denial aren't caused by the pain, but by my mind. So be, to be free of dukkha isn't to be free of pain or inconvenience. It doesn't make the grocery line go faster. But it's to be free of our the story of our mind tells that this is wrong or unfair or undeserved or whatever. Uh, it, it is what it is. We do what we can to change things and not fret about the rest. Uh, the solution to the problem of dukkha isn't to fix the world so that it's always the way we want it to be. The solution is to give up craving, aversion, delusion, to follow the Eightfold Path, to practice the Dharma until we achieve awakening. Partial awakening ends some dukkha, full awakening ends it all. At least that's my hope. But what do we need to practice the Dharma and achieve awakening? So clearly we don't require the world to be exactly the way we desire it to be at all times. So what do we need? Uh, so first, uh, uh, generally the question is our, our precious human birth, right? A gnat isn't capable of achieving awakening. I mean, if we're compassionate and willing to take on that karma, we might smash it and say, better luck next time. But even as humans, we have basic needs that can block the path. The, the traditional needs in Buddhism are food, shelter, clothing, and medicine. So we don't need a feast or a mansion or a, a fashionable wardrobe or the latest end-of-life medical intervention that late, late capitalist societies are capable of applying. But we do need the basics. If people are starving, homeless, is insufficiently clothed, have no basic health care, they're unlikely to be in a position to walk the Eightfold Path. So the response then is to give them what they need if we can, or in a modern society, perhaps try to achieve that goal socially or politically. But most of the people I know have all those things um, and they're still suffering. And a lot of people who, who seem to have all those things still suffer, even though they have the capacity and necessities to walk the path and walk towards, uh, work towards awakening and thus the end of suffering. So now what do we do? Uh, and, and here's where karuna comes in. So the Sanskrit is usually translated as compassion, sometimes sympathy. It's possible those are just as, as limited in translating dukkha just as suffering. So etymologically in English, compassion means suffering with and sympathy suffering together. Is that what karuna means, that I am also suffering? So Shantideva uh, argues yes, or at least I think that's what he argues. Uh, in his Guide to the Way of the Bodhisattva, uh, he considers compassion part of the arising of bodhicitta, the awakening mind. A and we cultivate it by meditating upon self and other until we see an equality 
between ourselves and others, and perhaps eventually no distinction at all, uh, that, <clears throat> that we consider the suffering of others as our own suffering, the lack of distinction between self and other, <clears throat> realizing the wisdom of emptiness is bodhicitta. The intention or desire to end the suffering of all is part of bodhicitta, and the idea seems to be that we will cultivate that intention best if we feel the suffering of others as our own. So there are uh, unexpected parallels in Western philosophy. The little red and much misunderstood philosopher Adam Smith comes to mind. Uh, and bear with me. In his theory of moral sentiments, he argues that our, our ability to imagine what others are experiencing creates sympathy and bonds us to each other. When we see others in pain and try to imagine that, uh, we develop compassion for them, just as we might say cry at a sad movie. That, that, it's, that, that sympathy and imagination is, is what allows us to be uh, moral with each other. But what does that mean? So for Smith, at least, any such suffering is a, is a very mild version of what someone being tortured, for example, might actually be feeling. Uh, I mean, we can see them be tortured and think, oh, oh, that we can imagine it, but it's not the same. But still, there, there, there are physiological reactions to various kinds of suffering, uh, like grief, depression, or PTSD, right? So people have problems eating or sleeping, fatigue, physical pain, heart palpitations, anxiety attacks, uh, feelings of helplessness and despair. Is this what we mean by compassion or sympathy or karuna? Actually suffering together that we literally and physically feel like this? So in, in Buddhism, Karana is, is one of the, the Brahma Vaharas, the four immeasurables, the divine abodes, and, and along with loving kindness, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And, and there's a, a Tibetan Buddhist uh, prayer I, I recite every day to try at least to cultivate these intentions. They go, it goes, may, may all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. May all beings never part from happiness beyond suffering. And may all beings rest in equanimity, free from attachment and hatred. So the second line of the prayer is, is the prayer for Karana. May all beings be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. So this prayer leads me to think differently of Karana. Um, it's not necessarily suffering with someone feeling their suffering in this physical sense, but instead wishing that they were free of the suffering. We, we see their suffering and wish them free. It's intentional, volitional. Uh, we wish all beings to be free from suffering, including ourselves. We see ourselves and others as equal, and we want us all to be free from suffering. Ultimately, I don't want to feel someone else's suffering in those physical senses. I don't even want to feel my own. So I sometimes think of it more as benevolence. And the, the, the etymology of benevolence uh, is wishing good, well-wishing. The Latin word vela means to wish, but it also gives us the word volition, to will something, to make a choice of something. So perhaps karana could be a matter of intention or volition as much as a physiological or emotional feeling of suffering. So, so first there's the, the intention to wish others free from suffering, from dukkha. However, we can also be more specific. I mean, if they lack the basic necessities of, of life, we can help provide food, clothing, shelter, medicine, if we can. But if they have all those, they, they have what they need to achieve awakening. So what can we do other than have or express the wish that they be free of suffering? Often, probably not much other than the wish, the intention, the volition. But first we have to understand the causes of suffering, uh, our own and other people's. So their suffering isn't caused by circumstances, but by their own craving, aversion and ignorance. So perhaps we could at least try not to feed that craving and aversion and ignorance. We could perhaps try to set an example uh, of the results of practice to be tranquil, equanimous, joyful, to crave less, to be less angry and hateful. What we probably shouldn't do is offer unsolicited advice. There's a, there's a good reason that traditionally in Zen, uh, students have to ask several times for instruction. You know? So quote, I feel bad because this thing happened to me I don't like, says your friend. And so you re respond, oh, the problem isn't that thing that happened, it's your mental aversion to it and the craving that it be different. You should give those up. 
uh, or the foolish advice I used to give soon after I started meditating uh, many years ago and experienced such delightful transformations in my attitude. Like, have you tried meditation? Uh, so now I might say jokingly, uh, well, try meditating 20 minutes a day for a year and you might, you might feel better. Um, oddly enough, nobody likes this advice, but it does make clear that there's no royal road to awakening. So in some circumstances, it might be possible for us to help remove barriers to practice or, or provide the four basic necessities that prepare people for practice. Ultimately, though, we can't end other people's suffering. We can, with luck and diligence, uh, possibly awaken ourselves, but we can't awaken others. They have to do the work. Even if we are formal Dharma teachers working with students, which I am not, we can't do the work for people. Dharma teachers can be guides, spiritual friends, supportive, but people have to do the work themselves. And people resist unsolicited advice. They often feel self-righteously justified in their suffering. Uh, I do. They don't want to know they can end it because they don't want to know that it comes on their own mind and not the world. It's very easy for all of us, I think, to blame the world. Um, so they have to want to end the suffering and they have to know how so that other than create a, an intention, uh, provide an example, the most we can do is, is maybe make people aware of the Dharma and of our willingness to share uh, and the rest is up to them. That's one thing we're doing uh, uh, right now. So Dukkha is, to conclude, Dukkha is caused by our minds and Karana, at least in, in one sense, is the wish that everyone be free of Dukkha, uh, even if there's no action we can take in a given situation. As we gradually awaken, hopefully, uh, we'll experience less dukkha, uh, more karana, that uh, as our own suffering lessens, we, we can see the suffering of others and, and see our own as we see our own and do what we can to help. And at the very least, uh, wish they were free from suffering and not contribute to it anymore. So awakening isn't just the end of dukkha, the mind resting undisturbed in the way. It also includes karana, though. So even Zen masters who have fully awakened, who have developed wisdom and prajna, who or prajna who know that mind is Buddha, who know the end of attachment of views and conceptions, still want to help others awaken. Uh, ultimately, that's our expression of karana. That's the uh, I think the bodhisattva ideal: awaken ourselves, wish for others to awaken, wait for that, so that all beings might be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. Uh, thank you for listening.